I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Would you please pray with me? Father God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the truth that is in it. And Lord, I pray that this morning that our hearts would be open to receive what it is that you have for us today. And so, Lord, it's in your holy name that we pray. Amen. Well, for those who were there, it is hard to forget the day, the night in New York City when all of the lights went out. On July 13th, 1977, a series of lightning bolts during a bad storm hit a couple of power substations on the Hudson River. These lightning strikes caused circuit breakers to trip and critical transmission lines to be taken out. And so with these lines being down, an overwhelming source of power was being diverted to New York City's largest generator. And because of that, all of this power caused this generator to be taken out as well, that generator to stop working, to shut down, which ensued the entire city of New York City being in the dark. All the power was out. And for the next 25 hours, total chaos would ensue. In a city already devastated by poor economic times, the darkness caused an eruption of looting and vandalism, including over a thousand reported cases of arson. In fact, at the end of the blackout, more than 4,000 looters were arrested, and 1,600 stores had been looted as well. It was a colossal mess, and it's kind of similar to what's been going on recently as well. Needless to say, when the lights came back on, everyone breathed a sigh of relief that this nightmare of being in the dark was over. Now, I don't know if you've experienced a blackout like that before in a city, but I think we all can relate to this experience of being separated from a source of power or a source of energy. Maybe you've seen this dreaded symbol on your phone telling you that your phone is about to run out of battery, and maybe even it's gotten so low that your phone battery died altogether. And so you had to run and find an electrical outlet to plug your phone into so that it could charge. Or maybe on a cold winter's day, you went out to start your car, but when you put your key in the ignition, nothing happened. It it failed to start, and so you had to call your friend to come over and jump your car battery to get that going so the, uh, that your engine could start. Or perhaps worst of all, you have experienced the trauma of a day of a morning that you went without that cup of coffee. Very disturbing to think about, right? Without that source of energy, you were pretty much useless the entire day. You couldn't continue on. Whatever the case may be, we've all experienced in some way this feeling of being cut off from a power source, being cut off from a source of energy. Well, this morning we are in our sermon series that we've been going through most of the summer called I Am. In fact, this is our last morning in this series. What we've done is we've looked at the seven I Am statements that Jesus makes in the Gospel of John. Seven statements that he makes about himself. And for each statement, what we've been doing in this series is we've been looking at the statement, but then kind of translating it into a way that applies to our lives. Translating it in a way that we can grasp and uh, hold on to. And so, just as an overarching review of what we've done so far. When Jesus says, 
I am the bread of life. How we can apply that is by knowing that in our life, Jesus is all we need. Jesus is all we need to really be sustained. When Jesus says, I am the light of the world, we can know that Jesus reveals what is true. When Jesus says, I am the door for the sheep, we can know that Jesus is the right way to God. When when Jesus says, I am the good shepherd, we can know that Jesus is our defender, that he stands on our behalf. When we, know, when we see Jesus say that He is the resurrection and the life, we can know that Jesus defeats death. And what we talked about last week, when Jesus says that He is the way, the truth, and the life, we know that Jesus is the only way to God. And today, we're looking at our last I Am statement. I am the true vine. I am the vine. And our application out of this phrase is this. Jesus is the source of life. Jesus is our power source. He is our life source. And if that doesn't make sense, if that doesn't quite resonate, uh, when I was thinking about this, this sermon and looking at this passage and trying to think of how to put this in maybe a term that would be easy to grasp, uh, a specific word came to mind a couple of times. And it's this word, vitality. Vitality. Now, what does it mean for something to have vitality? What does it mean if something is, is vital? If something is, is vital, if it has vitality, it has this, this sort of exuberance, right, that's just infectious. Right? There's, there's activity, there's energy, there's life, there's vibrancy. Have you ever experienced vitality like that in some way? Like maybe you had a friend who, whenever they entered a room, they just added energy. They just added life. They were filled with with love for other people. Or maybe you've been in an organization where you entered the building and it just, the atmosphere was in in such a way that it just felt like you knew that everyone loved working there. There was excitement, right? I think of Chick-fil-A, if you've ever been in a Chick-fil-A, one of my favorite restaurants. You go in there, there's a vitality. Everyone seems happy to be there. There's a source of energy, right? And after I eat uh, some chicken and waffle fries, I feel great. (laughs) Love me some chicken. But, you know, or maybe you've walked to a forest, right? You've walked through a forest or or along a a path or along the river and you just notice the vibrancy, the vitality of the wildlife that was around you. I think we all like being around things that have vitality because vitality is a clear sign of health. It's a sign of an inner joy and wellness. And this morning, Jesus talks about vitality through a metaphor that the people of his day would have understood. He uses an agricultural metaphor, and specifically, he uses a viticultural metaphor. He talks about the vitality of vines. So here's the context for this I am statement. So Jesus is, as we talked about a couple weeks ago, he's with his disciples in the upper room. This is a, 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 an intimate time. Jesus knows that he's going to die, and so this is kind of his last time that he has with his disciples to tell them what he thinks is most important for them to remember. Jesus knows that he's going to die on the cross. He has that in the forefront of his mind. And so at the end of chapter 14, Jesus says, Rise, let us go from this place. And so we assume that they leave this upper room that they're gathered in, and they begin to walk outside, making their way to the olive grove where Jesus was going to be betrayed and handed over to the authorities. And so as they're walking together, I would imagine that at some point they would have walked through a vineyard. And this vineyard would have inspired Jesus to say, I am the true vine. And here's what's so significant about Jesus comparing himself to a vine. In the Old Testament, God would often refer to the people of Israel as his vineyard. They were a vineyard planted by God. Look at this prime example in Isaiah chapter 5. The vineyard of the Lord Almighty is the nation of Israel. And the people of Judah are the vines he delighted in. He looked for justice from this vineyard, but he saw bloodshed. For righteousness, but heard cries of distress. 
God planted Israel to be a vineyard. But the problem was is they never produced good fruit. They never were able to produce the fruit that God was looking for. They lacked this vitality. They were always had something about them that was unhealthy. There was always something sick about this vine. But now we have Jesus, who is the true vine. The true vine. Where the vine of Israel failed to produce fruit, Jesus enters in as the true vine, who is the ultimate source of spiritual vitality and wellness. And how is this so? How do we know this to be true? Well, let's look at the text together this morning. We're going to start in, in verse 1. Again, Jesus says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. So again, here's our I am statement for this morning. I am the true vine. Jesus is the vine, and his Father is the vine dresser, and that God has control over his ministry, and God has control over the ministry of his disciples. And like I said a moment ago, Jesus is the true vine who's able to do what Israel could not do. And this is the good news of the gospel, right? Jesus is redeeming the failure of the nation of Israel and really our own failure. He's redeeming that and establishing himself as the true vine who's going to bring ultimate vitality to us through his death, and resurrection on the cross, from the cross. But what is the evidence of this vitality? How do we know that Jesus is the true vine? Because, we're told, he bears fruit. In fact, we see in this text that this is a pivotal sign of spiritual vitality. If you jump down to uh, verse 8, Jesus tells us that the Father is glorified by us bearing much fruit and so proving to be his disciples. A vine that bears grapes, that bears fruit, is healthy. In the same way, a Christian that bears spiritual fruit in their life is healthy as well. External spiritual fruit is the evidence of internal spiritual health. And in the same way we see in in verse 2, if a branch doesn't bear fruit, it's tossed aside, it's thrown into the fire. And if it does bear fruit, it's pruned so that it can bear more fruit. But I want to hold on for a moment here because I don't want to speak too much Christianese. Do you know what I'm saying? Christianese is like, as Christians, if we've we've grown up in church, we kind of have this language we speak. You know, that maybe people wouldn't understand if they're not uh, having grown up in church. And I think spiritual fruit is one of those words. And so what do we mean when we talk about spiritual fruit? What does it mean to bear fruit as a Christian? Well, at its core, I would describe spiritual fruit as, as being the reflection of the gospel in your life. How do you reflect the good news of Jesus in your life? How has, has the gospel changed you? How, how are you spiritually vital because of the gospel? And I think this spiritual vitality, it comes in three ways. The first is in our righteousness. And this is maybe what we would mostly think of when we think of spiritual fruit, right? This is the actions that we do. Are you bearing spiritual fruit in your actions? Do your actions reflect the change that the gospel has made in your life, right? If I'm at a restaurant, do I treat the waitress there with dignity and respect in the way that Jesus would treat her? If I'm hanging out with friends and the conversation turns to crude joking and to heavy drinking, do I participate in that or do I abstain to show that there's something different inside of me? I think we all would agree that embracing a life change is a part of our journey of growing closer to Christ, right? As we grow deeper in our faith, hopefully our actions and our righteousness is going to grow as well. Not in like a a legalistic way, but just out of our love for Christ, right? We're going to grow in that way. So this is certainly a spiritual fruit that we bear in our life. 
A second category is in our relationships, fruit of our relationships. How do we reflect the gospel in our relationships? What I specifically mean here is what role are you playing in helping others grow in their relationship with Christ? Right? If, if you have a friend who's not a Christian, are you uh, uh, bearing fruit by trying to lead them to Jesus, telling them about Jesus, telling them, sharing with them the gospel? Are you bearing fruit with someone who is a Christian, maybe someone who's younger than you in the faith and trying to help them grow in their faith, discipling them in some way? Or even allowing yourself to be discipled by someone else? It's about bearing fruit for the kingdom through the relationships in your life. And then the third category, I would say, of spiritual fruit is replenishment. Replenishment. In other words, is your soul being daily refreshed by the gospel? Is your soul being daily renewed by the good news of Jesus? Are you experiencing a heart that is rejuvenated, a refreshment? It comes when you experience intimacy with God as you walk through your daily life. Is Jesus rejuvenating your heart in that way? Are you being replenished? The evidence of spiritual health is that your soul is going to feel replenished within you, which will help fuel your your outward righteousness and help fuel your relational witness. So those three things, righteousness, uh, relationships and replenishment are, I would say, evidence of spiritual fruit. That's how I would define spiritual fruit in your life. But after going through all of this, my guess is that when you look at that list of three things, there's probably at least one of those things, if not two or all three, in which you feel like maybe you're not measuring up, right? Maybe you're active in evangelism, but your personal life doesn't quite match up. You still have some things that you're struggling with in your actions. Or maybe you are righteous in your actions, but your heart, if you were to look at your heart, is stale in your relationship with Christ. It's almost become more of a legalistic thing for you. I think the fact of the matter is that we all have at some point, and we all will at some point, lack spiritual Christian vitality. We're all going to struggle with it in some way. But the question is, why? Why? Why do we sometimes lack spiritual vitality? More importantly, how do you regain that in your life? What does that look like? Well, let's look at what Jesus says about this. Jump back into the text in verse 4. Jesus says, Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself, unless it abides in the vine... Neither can you unless you abide in me. So again, the first question is, is why do we lack spiritual vitality? Why do I sometimes feel dry in my walk with Christ? Well, the answer Jesus gives is simple. We feel dry because somewhere along the way, you have been disconnected from the source. Somewhere along the way, you have been disconnected from the power source, right? A phone battery runs out when it hasn't been plugged in for quite some time. The city of New York lost power when the generator went out, when it became disconnected from the power source. In the same way, when you aren't connected to the source of your faith, Jesus Himself, you will eventually lose power. You will eventually run dry. As Jesus puts it plainly, you can't bear fruit unless you abide in Him, unless you remain in Him, unless you stay plugged into Him. And that's the key to the second question brought up. How do we regain that spiritual vitality? Let's keep reading uh, verse 5. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me, my words abide in you. Ask whatever you wish, it will be done for you. 
So the metaphor that Jesus is working through here of a vine continues, except this time he emphasizes the fact that he is the vine and we as Christians are the branches. But then Jesus gives us the secret for how we maintain vitality. By abiding or remaining in him. In Jesus himself. By staying plugged into the power source. Again, I don't want to speak Christianese. I want to be clear about this. So what exactly do we mean when we talk about abiding in Jesus? Well, I think it can simply be put this way. Abiding in Jesus is practicing presence. Practicing presence. Practicing being in God's presence. Here's another way to think about it. Are you inviting Jesus into the everyday rhythms of your life? Are you practicing presence by inviting Jesus into the everyday rhythms of your life? You know, I think one of the mistakes we often make as Christians is that we designate Sunday mornings, this one hour of our week, for uh, our Jesus time, right? This is our Jesus time. This is when we're going to try to grow spiritually. But then we kind of separate that from the rest of our week. So if there's 168 hours in the week, only one of them is for Jesus, and the 167 is for anything else that we're doing. But I think what we need to do, that the key to faith vitality is inviting Jesus into the 167 hours that you spend outside of the church building as well. For instance, do you wake up each morning with, with a sense of asking God to be with you during the day? Or are you intentional to see how God might be guiding you in that conversation with a coworker, or how He might be guiding you in your interaction with the teller at the bank? I know for me, as I, one way that I have to be intentional, and I'm not always perfect at this, is trying to ask God to be with me as I'm leaving work and going home and, and entering into my house because sometimes I don't know what's going to be behind that door when I walk in. <laughs> Sometimes it's a screaming, crying zoo. And so sometimes I need to ask God to be with me to have patience and and to be able to answer into the fray. Another example would be finding time to spend in prayer, right? Especially continuous prayer throughout the day. Having that intimate time in God's Word. You know, one tool that I use is an app called Dwell, which is a kind of a unique app that allows me to hear the Bible being read. And it's kind of a cool way to engage by by hearing the words of Scripture and meditating on it. There's something powerful about that. The uh, medieval theologian Thomas Akempis calls this the fostering of a familiar friendship with Jesus. Abiding is fostering a familiar friendship with Jesus. I love that. I love how he puts that. The key to remaining vital in your faith is remaining connected to the power source. Because when we separate our daily life from our Christian life, we cut ourselves off from the source of life. When we allow our lives to be defined by our intentional desire to be connected to Jesus, we're able to experience this vitality that comes from Him. And when we are connected to Jesus in this way, we desire the same things He does. Our hearts are aligned with His, which is why He says we can pray for anything in His name and it will be done. Because our hearts are on the same page with Jesus. But here's something else that's important for us to understand. If we practice the presence, if we are connected, if we are a branch that's connected with the vine, if we practice this presence, we're also going to be pruned. We're going to experience pruning, which isn't always something we like to hear. That we're going to be chipped away, that there's going to be pieces of us that are chipped away. Because the more we are like Christ, the more we are in Christ's presence, the more we will be challenged to be like Him, which means that the parts of my heart, the parts of my life that are decaying, that aren't of God, He's going to cut those away. They're going to be cut off. But why do, we, why do we need to be pruned? Why is that necessary? Well, Jesus tells us in verse 2, Every branch within me that bears fruit, he prunes. Meaning every Christian that's connected to Jesus, God is going to prune. Why? 
that it may bear more fruit. That it may bear more fruit. God prunes us so that our spiritual fruit may increase. We are pruned so that we can grow in righteousness. So that we can grow in relational evangelism and relational discipleship. And so that we can be replenished from the Holy Spirit. Being in Christ allows God to prune us. Even if it's painful. So that we can bear more spiritual fruit in our lives. But there's one more piece to all of this. So hop over with me to verse 9. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. So all of this is based on Jesus' love for us. Jesus loves us as the Father had loved Him, which is a rather profound thing to think about when you think about how much God the Father loves God the Son. And it's with this in mind that Jesus tells us that to to not only abide in Him, not only just remain in His presence, but also to remain in His love for us. And what He means by this is something we talked about earlier, right? If you practice being in the presence of Jesus, you will experience His love for you. In other words, you will bear the spiritual fruit of soul replenishment when you remain in Christ's presence. And the primary way that Jesus spells out for us how we can experience His love is by keeping His commandments. Which is kind of a, might seem like a weird way to do that, but this is why we should seek out righteousness another form of spiritual fruit in our lives. Because when we are faithful to obey Jesus' commands, we are able to experience, in turn, His love for us. Even though obedience is demanding, it demands something of us, it leads us to the direct result of spiritual fruit. Joy. Or really, it's a clear sign of vitality, of that spiritual health. Jesus tells us that the reason for all of what He has commanded us to do in this way is that we would have joy, that we would have spiritual vitality, and that we would have it to the fullest extent. So let me conclude by presenting this challenge. What is one way that you can allow God to prune you so that you can experience spiritual vitality, so that you can bear more spiritual fruit? Do you need to invite God to be with you as you spend more time practicing presence with Him? Do you need to ask for boldness in sharing the Gospel? That's always a prayer of mine, that I would be bold in sharing the Gospel. Or is it simply asking God to renew your spirit and your heart, to refresh your soul so that you can experience His love in a powerful way? Because at the end of the day, This is how God is most glorified. When we bear much fruit. When our joy in Him is full. Let's pray. Lord, we thank You for Your Word. Lord, we thank You that You are the true vine. That we are the branches. Lord, we thank You that You accept us as we are, but You don't leave us that way. That in this spiritual walk, there is pruning, there is growth. But Lord, it's all rooted in your love for us. That you are most glorified when we bear the most fruit. And so Lord, I pray that you would grow each and every one of us individually in some way. That you would challenge us to uh, allow ourselves to, to be in your presence, to practice presence with you, to abide with you, to invite you into the everyday rhythms of our life so that we can grow. We continue to be transformed more and more into your image. Father, I thank you for your word. Thank you for this truth. 
So Lord, it's in your holy, precious name that we pray. Amen. Well, my benediction, or really my prayer for you, church, this morning is simply this. That you, or may Christ dwell, or abide, in your hearts, through faith. May Christ dwell in your hearts through faith. May Jesus abide in you and may you abide in Him.